coming in as we're as we're kicking this off. Um, so I just want to get rolling because we've got um, I, we've got some amazing presenters, and I want to give them the bulk of the time to uh, show us and talk to us about what they've been doing. So first, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Amanda Simons, and I'm the Studio Operations Manager at Penland School of Craft. I'm in charge of the nine employees that run the 16 studios here. So um, I'm, I have the bird's eye view of all media from like tiny minute uh, jewelry making to large scale uh, sculpture. We're trying to think of all those things in terms of COVID right now. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I also want to just preemptively thank our generous presenters for sharing all of their knowledge with us today. Um, I wanna give you a brief history about how this group got started because we've actually been meeting since uh, March-ish. So in March, we all got tossed into this thing, um, schools closing, sending students home, and studio managers, we were all in that same boat of being like, what, what are we to do? Like, what, what does my space look like now? Um, what does my job look like? Uh, who's the epidemiologist in charge of making all these procedures, and it turns out we are. So this group started out of necessity for um, sharing so that we weren't all trying to create the same procedures in different bubbles around the country. So this group really has been an opportunity for us all to come together and pool resources and talk about what's challenging and see if each other has solutions or not. Um, so I have a big network of folks that have been involved since March. And if you want to be on that mailing list for future things, um, I'm going to drop my email address down in the chat in a little bit here. And all you got to do is send me an email and say that you want to be on the mailing list and I'll include you going forward. Um, so I also want to introduce my co-facilitator uh, who's representing the West Coast, Nicole. And I also want to thank her because in, in a lot of ways, she was the inspiration for this. I attended a support group that she had put together and she had advertised on Instagram. And um, that, so this really was the spark that launched this incredible network of people that are coming together. So Nicole, would you introduce yourself, please? So yeah, first of all, just shout out to Chanda, my co-host for that first studio manager support group, um, who's one of our panelists today. Um, and uh, my name is Nicole Gugliotti. I'm the studio technician at South Puget Sound Community College. And um, today we're going to be sharing with you, uh, oh, my pronouns are she and her. We're going to be sharing with you um, folks from across the country working in small or organizations, higher ed, community schools, craft schools, including residential programs um, today. So really exciting stuff. We're also going to have some time at the end for folks to share because we know a lot of people have gone back to in-person stuff. Um, so first of all, we are recording this. Um, you don't have to turn on your video if you're not comfortable being on the recording. No problem. You can still unmute and talk uh, if need be. Um, we are just sharing our experiences. We're No one here works for the CDC. So uh, and honestly, guidelines are going to vary based on what we're looking to as far as like the CDC, where we are, state, county, and even institution. So you're gonna wanna make sure everything uh, jives with anything that you need to do there. But um, we're gonna just be getting some like on the ground experience, experiences shared today. We're gonna have about 45 minutes-ish for the panel presentations. We'll have about a half an hour for Q&A. And then as we wrap up, we're also gonna ask for folks who who are not on the panel, who have done in-person uh, instruction thus far, just to share any super practical um, things that have worked or anything you know that has not worked that you think other people would love to know about. And we'll um, I'll figure out a way to include these. We'll figure out a way to include these suggestions in the video as well. And I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. All right, I'm going to talk about those super boring Zoom rules just so that we're all on the same page. Um, it, unless you're speaking, you should mute your microphone. 
Uh, as Nicole said, it's okay to turn off your video. We're mostly going to be um, watching presenters and if they have images, watching their images. Um, you, and as Nicole said, you can use your chat for questions, comments, resource sharing, that sort of thing. If you have a question that's specific to a presenter, we're going to ask that you hold that until our Q&A session because we're going to do a Q&A with everybody all at the end. Um, where Nicole and I will be moderating um, through that, that pool of questioning and sort of like giving the questions over to folks. Um, let's see, one more Zoom thing, uh, super handy. If you go to your upper right, there's a, there's a little button that says speaker view or gallery view. It's gonna be best to click speaker view for this because that will highlight the person that's talking and put all those um, tiny squares of humans uh, somewhere else, so you don't have to look at everybody all at once. You can just see the person that's talking. Um, and then panelists, uh, you have about five to seven minutes. We're, Nicole or I are going to give you about a six-minute warning so that you know when you've got about 60 seconds left of talking. And if you go over, you go over. That's totally fine. But we'd love, we'd love for you to be mindful of just the five to seven-minute window. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Nicole and let's take it away with our first presenter. Sorry. Um, our first presenter today is Lisa Conway. She is faculty at Clark College in Vancouver, just south of me, so a local uh, a, a neighbor for me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you, Lisa. Hi, thanks. Thanks for doing this, you guys. And um, I love seeing every all the little heads. <laughs> I just love seeing people. So this is a great group. Um, I'm a little, um, um, I don't know, excited, flustered, um, because I just got back like a half an hour ago from meeting with my first students in person um, for over seven months. Um, so I just had that experience this morning. Um, and it went well. Um, usually, well, let me go back a little bit. Um, I've been chairperson of the department at Clark College for 12 years. So uh, when the shutdown happened, I helped organize not just how the ceramics area would deal with it, but all of our areas and um, things like from adjusting all the lab fees that we charge for classes to helping coordinate with the bookstore and what they could do to make, um, you know, art kits available for students to pick up, um, you know, trying to figure out if all of our classes could even be taught online, um, and just so many other things. Um, but mostly I've been dealing with ceramics, my area, and um, taught fully online in the spring, although we were able to have students drop off work curbside for a contact-free um, way of doing kiln firing. So that enabled our spring ceramics classes to go, which was wonderful. Students worked at home with clay that they picked up curbside. They glazed their pieces at home with a little to-go glaze kit that they also picked up curbside. And um, it, it worked for them to work at home. Over the summer, we allowed students to check out pottery wheels to take home. They put down a refundable deposit um, and that worked out well too. So we had students using our, our wheels at home, um, although they were still primarily doing hand building. Um, this fall, which started about a week ago, um, we're only doing the wheel checkout with our most advanced students because we don't have 60 wheels, um, but we can check out a handful of them. So we spent the summer um, going through the studio and creating distanced um, workstations for each ceramic student. Um, so we can accommodate 10 students at a time, which is half of our normal capacity. Um, because we didn't get permission to do this until halfway through the summer for this fall our lab access for students is optional so mm, some of them are still only working at home not coming in for these labs it's a little hard for me to tell at this point 
I'm working on setting our winter schedule and I don't know things that aren't coming in are not coming in because they don't want the increased exposure or how many are not coming in because of scheduling conflicts. Um, so it's, you know, not everything is happening in the order that I want it to happen in, in terms of getting permission and then making the class schedule. We had to make the class schedule and then we got permission afterwards. So that um, made things interesting. Um, but um, we have um, 10 spots, everything is distance. They all have their own tools in their spots. So we have 10 rolling pins, 10 banding wheels, 10 spray bottles, 10 you know, sets of brushes, 10, 10 of everything. Um, and then 11 of everything because there's an instructor station too. Um, we're, I'm really fortunate to work for an institution, a state institution, we're a public community college. So you know, we do have an emergency management team at Clark College and they are setting the rules. And I am so grateful for that, that I don't have to decide, you know, if we have to wear a face shield in addition to a mask and our bandanas okay or not okay. Um, you'd somebody else. And um, I'm really grateful because just last week we had a positive case result of a student on our campus. It was in a different area, um, a different department and because all of the protocols are in place, because students have to take a, a screening questionnaire every day before they come in, there's a required temperature check. Everyone has to wear masks 100% of the time, mandatory distance. Like I feel okay in the fact that there was a case in another part of campus, but we're still meeting, um, I'm still meeting students in the art building. So I'm, I'm just grateful for that. Um, and it's like one day at a time, you know, it kind of feels like the Wild West out here. Um, but I don't want to go over my time too much. So if anyone has questions pertaining to things I brought up, feel free to put them in the chat and I can respond um, that way. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what all the rest of y'all say. How's that? That was great, Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Hiroko Yamada, who's a faculty member at Madison College in Madison, Wisconsin, who teaches fine metals. Um, Hiroko, I'm going to start your slide presentation, and uh, I just need yep. you to tell me when you want me to yep. advance the slides, all right? Okay. Yep. You can go ahead. Um, my name is Hiroko Yamada, and um, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, instructing the, uh, not only the Madison, Wisconsin, but it's uh, also uh, throughout the workshop in the United States and, and then back and forth in Japan. Um, this is, uh, the beginning of the slides is that uh, they are set up the uh, classroom in Japan. The reason though, you can go next, the reason that I was in Japan uh, teaching in June. A Japanese academic year started in April. So then they were shut down on February, March. Graduation is not there for them. But they have quickly started to uh, set up a studio so that um, we can start classes in March, uh, April. So uh, we have a lot of meetings, a uh, lot of de dealing with what we can do, what we can't. Uh, we didn't really decide on Japanese um, uh, craft school and the schools and university didn't really decide that they're gonna close the campus. So their pursuit, uh, keep it open just because the number of the students, uh, the number of the students and if who affected in the coronavirus is much less than is any other country that they, they thought they can control that. Uh, those are the very good example for me to start it in the semester in September. So I was talking to them very uh, closely what they can do and what they can't. So you can go next. So then um, my field is a metalsmith and jewelry. And then we, uh, Japanese uh, classroom, they keep it in a social distance. So they um, less students in the classroom, limited number of people, and then most importantly, 
of course, they have to wear the mask and then the picture is not wearing the mask. Uh, but most importantly, the air has to be flow in the classroom. So the study shows that if, what if 10,000 square feet on the classroom, you have a two door window open air flow, uh, that it's about uh, three to four minutes to air circulate it. If you have only one door open and then you have the fan taking exhaust out to the air and then about the seven minutes to get the air flow. So that was the studies. And then this is the summertime. So they have, they, they have to collect the window open, both window open at the air conditions at the same time. You can go next. So then, of course, the kindergartens, uh, they all have to have a shear when they're eating and then the kids are with a mask most of the time. We can go next. So then they quickly design how the classroom can be um, done. So then uh, they also, you can go next, um, uh, create uh, quickly temporarily uh, using the sh uh, shear that it's uh, fixed glass or the vinyl um, for the front of the uh, students on the desk. You can go next. Uh, this is the more uh, recent design for the classroom. Uh, they have the, those flex glass in front of the students. You can go next. And then if they don't have any shears, then <laughs> students, it looks really uh, uh, serious, but it's, they take it really seriously in the classroom. This is in, in uh, uh, just about the starting April. Uh, they have a face shears and mask at the same time. And we can go next. And this is the, yeah, the age six of the first grade students uh, also do the same. We can go next. And then for, of course, it's the um, airflow and then you're uh, playing the music is uh, most concern. So then they come up to the idea of another shield uh, like this to practice the music. You can go next. And then this is another example of uh, there, if there is no social distance between the students, then they, they have to uh, work in the, between the shears. You can go next. And when they're eating, you have to take off the mask, shears. So then, uh, yeah, you, you can uh, eating in the box. And then this is about the, uh, about the May, in May. And the next one. So then uh, the school started at uh, Madison College. Uh, University of Wisconsin actually made a news, national news of uh, clusters started and generated in the dome, uh, undergraduate dome. So the, on the undergraduate students sent back form for two weeks. Uh, during that uh, Madison College that we're taught is uh, local students. So we are able to manage not to get the cluster started. Uh, of course, we have a screening, so we have a limited students to come into this uh, uh, building for the class in the classroom. We have a screen for the six uh, questioning about the, about the health, and then if you pass, to, uh, pass to those screening, and then there is the uh, building entrance, there's a security person check this uh, uh, questioning survey every day. And then we have also a limited number of students come into the classroom. Next one. Uh, the bathroom, we have a lot of uh, divider and then the water fountains, we have a sign for not to use uh, the fountain directly, but it's to fill up the water. Next one. And then the metal studios, we have each bench of 15 and then we sit at students a limited seat every other bench and then also we have a, another shear between them and then also we have a set up the kit that it's only they can use in the kit. Next one. And uh, also the instructor, I have uh, face max and I like the face shear and the, these uh, flex glass shear. And then the soldering bench, we have another divider to, to get the shears. So, and then the exhaust uh, is running the whole time. I think it's the next one's the last. This one's the last. 
Yep, that's it. Yep, uh, that's it. So most importantly, um, that we are really thinking to not to get infected is a social distance and then wear the mask. But what we know uh, now is that it's uh, infected to the coronavirus is the people who are uh, not to have the symptoms, but before get the symptoms of three, four, four days before. So it's very hard to tell, even though you have a checklist of the health conditions. So um, both of us, um, teacher and then uh, students, are keeping in the wear the mask. Um, I tend to wear the face shear all the time. And then uh, because of that, it's uh, very difficult to instruct it. So I have uh, uh, microphones and then uh, the, even the demos that people doesn't come to the demo table, but we have uh, um, a screen that you can project the, what the hands, what, what uh, yeah, the in, uh, demonstrations on on your hands, something like that. Very cool. Thank you, Hiroko. Welcome. The microphones. That's genius. Okay, our next um, speaker is the studio coordinator at Anderson Ranch Art Center in Colorado, and. Um, Louise, I'm sorry, I should have asked you beforehand how to pronounce your last name, but Louise De Go ahead. <laughs> Louise De Juan. De Juan. Take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Louise. I'm the studio coordinator at Anderson Ranch uh, of the ceramics department. So I did a little PowerPoint because we did run some in-person classes this summer. In March, we cancel all our workshops and we have several departments and many students coming over the summer. So it was a huge um, movement for all of, well, for the whole world. But So we moved all the classes online and ceramics, I, at the time I did not agree of having like workshops, demonstrations online. So we created a new program then called Conversations on Clay, which was held through the whole summer, twice a week, was more like lecture-based presentations and discussions. And by June, we were already more comfortable with the COVID situation. Anderson Ranch team worked on a safety business plan and submitted to our county. And we were approved, so we could start having visitors coming to campus again. One of the biggest changes was that um, the campus was only open Monday to Friday, nine to five. And during our workshops, um, it's usually 24 seven. So students can come and go all the time. We decided to only run workshops in ceramics and in the kids building. And the main reason was because all the other departments, they were full on online. They had like two to three classes happening online and we did it. Uh, I only had like two afternoons so I could run classes. We are also very lucky that we, Anderson Ranch is in a valley that has a huge artistic community and amazing ceramic artists. So I could plan classes with our teachers being locals. And that was the focus. We wanted um, local artists teaching local um, audience, our public. And it was a surprise because we actually had people coming from all over the country. We had people from New York, from Kentucky, from Georgia, from California. So that was a big surprise. Um, the new business safety plan, we closed the dormitory. So for hosting workshops, that was a huge thing. We couldn't host people on campus and we still can't. And the cafe had to change the way we operated. So it usually was a family style buffet and now we change it was um, a la carte and only lunches. Again, in the water as well, like we, we were not offering water. People had to bring water for the whole day being here. Um, part of the plan was, you know, to maintain six foot distance from one another. We have to wear masks all the time. And if you have any symptoms, you stay at home. So when students enroll in the class, they received a waiver that they had to sign and they had to agree with the five commitments of containment. So keep the distance, wash their hands often, 
use the mask all the time. If they're sick, stay at home. Um, and if something happens, they should report to us right away. When they got onto campus, and this is this slide here, they, everyone, all the staff and all the students, we go to the check-in center. So we have a couple of our staff members who were taking temperatures and symptom tracking. This is a way that if something happens and someone tests positive, we can go back to who were, was on campus and then we can alert and have a, some, some sort of control um, over the pandemic or the spread of it. Um, so we, what I did, each student had their own table, their own wheel, their own card, their own set of tools. Each station was six feet apart or more. And we only had nine students max per workshop. In, you, we have two huge studios. One of them, this one on the picture, is called the Sodner. We can host 14 students in a normal time. We only host uh, five. And the other one, the long studio, we could have 12 in a normal summer, and we only had four. So we really reduced the number and had a lot of space between all the students. We also had doors and windows open at all times, and we are on the mountains, so sometimes it can be chilly here. So we encourage students to bring layers of clothes because they were not really allowed to close the windows. They had to be just putting layers on them. The first class that I ran, as you can see on the tables, I label everyone was color coded. So each station was like a color. Um, you're not allowed to get in someone else's studio space. That was a I was trying to be very visual about their space and their limits. And then the other classes, I didn't go as crazy because it's a lot of work to do that. We made those stickers. People were six feet apart to watch the demos. And that was another factor that limited for nine students because if I had more, they would become too far from the, the teacher. So they wouldn't really be able to see the demos in an effective way. This is Allegheny teaching. He just finished a three week class here at the ranch. We did a huge, so in between classes, we washed the studios and that's a normal practice. We just did more in depth, I would say. So we, at every day, at the end of the day, we had um, our cleaning staff. We have two ladies that would come and deep clean the bathroom every day. Uh, at the end of the class, me and another couple of staffs would wash the studios. And then every weekend we hired a professional cleaning crew that would come and deep sanitize the studios and the bathrooms too. Each student also had, um, they also had a little bottle, spray bottle with water in Clorox. So they were encouraged to clean their areas at the end of every day. And every morning before the class started, I would come in and clean doorknobs, the sinks, the light switches, like the common area that were touched. So I'd clean with the wipes, Clorox wipes, and at the end of the day, I would do the same. So twice a day that it was clean. And we had a lot of cleaning materials available so students could help keep things clean as well. One of the practical things that changed for me for running workshops was uh, the kiln firings. We usually have students involved in uh, loading the kiln and firing the kilns. And this time they were not uh, welcome to be there loading the kilns. It was only me and um, two assistants. I actually had one assistant per class, but like the spring soda, I needed more people. So I asked the other, like another assistant to come in to spray the soda. They did participate in the wood firing. We had a wood firing. Um, so we had gloves that have not been used for months. So they were kind of quarantined. Uh, but once they used, they came to another box and they're not gonna be used for a few weeks until someone else can use it. It was very rewarding like um, to run the classes and have people, you know, seeing people making and learning again and sharing experience. and. We're all on this together. So I think there was a lot of respect for COVID and following protocols. So 
it was a great experience. We can do it safely. Louise, thank you so much. That was really great to see all those images. Um, let's see, our next presenter is Mary Jo Murphy, who's the executive director of Snow Farm, uh, which is located in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. So Mary Jo, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Okay, can you hear me? Great. So um, it's interesting because we're all coming from a lot of different types of organizations. And just to paint the picture of what um, our craft school is about, we're in a rural area. We're usually about a $1.3 million budget. Um, we have a very small staff. We have just about nine full-time staff, but we usually contract um, over 150 different artists from the region and throughout the United States. And so we have been closed since um, mid-March and we reopened uh, August 6th for in-person classes. We did not do any online classes um, during that time. And so uh, Massachusetts has been really very, I would say, um, conservative as they have um, unfolded the guidelines and opened up um, organizations. And so we had to look at both accommodation guidelines, restaurant guidelines, and then also sort of education for the school. And so I would say, um, so we've operated um, again, um, and we have classes through the end of October and we've been operating safely. So we have all those things that um, everybody else has been talking about, the plexiglass, everybody wears a mask, um, we've separated, um, have you know, toolkits, have airflow, we have all those things going on. And we also, so what our state required of us is to have this it's called a containment, COVID containment plan. And though we didn't need to submit it to anyone, we just needed to have it on hand, but it allowed me to create a really fully comprehensive um, binder about everything that um, we needed to communicate externally as well as internally. So if you go to our website, um, snowfarm.org, you'll see what our students would see about how we prepared for um, the reopening and have classes. But then we also did a lot of internal documents. And I realize many of you are students, I should say I'm the executive director. So I've taken the lead in every, in, in leading um, all sort of parts of our programming and our reopening. And so we had to have internal documents about training staff, and um, I would say that um, once we prepared all the information about what we were going to do, we let it, um, we, we talked about how then it was the students and the instructors turn to take that information and determine if they wanted to come here. So I will say that um, we had existing classes that were already scheduled for August, September, October which we continued. We um, added some classes that had been canceled into our programming where we could. And then we, um, we did reach out to our instructors to see who was comfortable. And we had instructors, artists coming from not just Massachusetts, but from around the country. So on a programming standpoint, operating has been challenging because our state has um, has changed there's changed guidelines as to who can come into the state without quarantining and who can come into the state um, without a quarantine uh, period so we've had to navigate that sometimes they've been able to take a test and we've actually not known until probably two days before running a class whether that class could run based on the test we were confident that the instructor had been, um, you know, had been, uh, you know, sort of self-quarantining and there would be negative results, but we still didn't know. So the time frame of has been crunched. So we kept a very flexible refund policy. So people, if they have any symptoms they feel might be related to COVID or COVID symptoms, they can cancel that day 
even that morning. Um, and we will refund or, or move their funds. So that's been really important to make sure people don't feel like they are obligated if they're feeling a little bit, you know, under the weather or something that they can't drop. So shifting the numbers and the information has been really um, cha a challenge for our staff as well to manage that constant flow of information that's going on. So I would say that probably of the classes we already had scheduled and we reached back out to our instructors, I would say about 50% of them, um, they, they declined to come and teach at, at Snow Farm, whether they were from far away and we just, um, you know, couldn't, didn't see that they would be able to come because of the quarantining or they were uncomfortable being back in the setting. And so we had to work with them and we left it entirely up to them whether they were uh, comfortable with how we had prepared if they were willing to teach and and so also our students sort of with enrollment we found that those classes that people had held on since they registered say back in december for the classes that's the students who held on through all this time really you know have showed up but we also made phone calls to them to just say because of our cancellation policy, we really want you to, you know, it helps us if you make that decision earlier rather than later of whether you're comfortable coming. So that's a little bit about just sort of the managing of our program, which might not apply to, um, you know, to all of you. Um, just on the supplies, we definitely really um, looked at other industries. We finally, after five months of ordering, we received our electrostatic disinfectant sprayer, which airlines and hotels are using, and we're using it now. So it, it, the technology really um, has the disinfectant adhere to surfaces in a very quick, fast way. So it eliminates and reduces the amount of time and, and of course, costs um, associated with cleaning an entire space. Um, by hand. So that's, we're really thrilled to have that um, in, in uh, place. And so as a nonprofit, we are really, you know, we're, we don't have a huge endowment. We don't have any endowment. We don't have huge cash reserves. So we have to be really careful. So some of our cost savings, um, we've had to sort of shift to full-time staff. Um, we do a deep clean every day of our um, restrooms. We've also added three high-touch cleanings every day. And so our strategy here overall is really try to have two layers of protection in at most times. So the first layer is our mask and the second layer is either say being outdoors or the second one is six feet apart or behind a flexi shield. So we try to keep that two layer sort of strategy going. And our second strategy is just keep the, I sort of call them pods, um, small. So um, if I have, we have under 10 people, including the instructor in any studio, and we have run our metal smithing, our ceramics, our um, textile, our painting and drawing, woodworking, um, and, um, and uh, kiln glass, stained glass, mosaics, uh, we've run all those studios. The only studio we closed down was glass blowing. And, um, and so if you're in that studio with the instructor, you eat together at the same table together and you use the same rest uh, bathroom. And you also, if you're staying on campus, we did open our accommodations. You also stayed at, you're in the same dorm. And so that's where we're trying to keep those pots really small so if there is a case you know we have very few people to um, contact and we're also doing the same approach with staff staff are um, all staff have most all staff have come back in person to our uh, our offices um, but we still encourage working at home and we assign only um, you know, certain amount of staff to each session. So if I have a five day session, there's only say two staff people who are connected to that session. So in, again, sort of thinking in the worst case scenario, how many people will I have to say, 
were exposed because there was no mask wearing, you know, when eating or something like that, really keeping those numbers um, as low as possible. Um, we continue to have work study here, um, so we, had, uh, we have them here. Um, we are seeing a lot of repeat students, so students who are comfortable, they've been coming back two, three, even four times to take our class classes. And so we've gotten really wonderful feedback from our instructors, our students, about all the policies and procedures and guidelines. And so overall, what we are trying to do is of course, keep everybody safe and have these guidelines in place and the distancing in place. However, it's still a creative time and we want people to um, enjoy their time here. And so we really try to um, not be, um, though we have postings and signs up, we want to, and, and everybody does sign a waiver before they come here so they understand their expected to wear a mask the entire, you know, the entire time they're here when they're indoors um, and around other people. Um, and we do have, we have put, we have ability if they're not following those rules that they can be asked to leave without refund. So we, we are upfront with what our expectations are. However, we have let people, it's mostly adults, you know, it's adults here, in that they are going to be responsible. And we found that everybody has been really terrific about following all the guidelines that um, we put in place. Um, and so, time. Oh, okay, I'll just say that food has been a little bit the biggest challenge just because we have to um, um, prepare it and put it in a container and we're only offering one option um, per meal, but we're doing all three meals. So, um, so I think, um, you know, we are thrilled to be back um, open and people are really appreciative of that we have done this effort and we are preparing for um, hopefully a full season in 2021 um, based on sort of the current situation. So thanks. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce our next panelist, and they are Chanda Zia, the Facilities and Programming uh, Person at Pottery Northwest in Seattle, Washington. So Chanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Nicole. And I, I just want to start out by saying a big thank you um, to Nicole and Amanda for organizing this. I think it's really phenomenal um, that we're all coming together to share our experiences because as most of you know, we're all facing different challenges depending on where our state is at since there is no universal guidelines from the federal government. Um, and so here in Seattle, um, I'm at Pottery Northwest. I not only manage the facilities, but I also do all the planning of the programming, which is our classes. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd make it easy. Um, so in mid-March, um, we entirely closed down um, and we kept all of our staff on board. We're fairly, we're a nonprofit. 70% of our income comes from our classes and we have a full-time staff of four people, um, plus a, a host of work studies that assist me to keep the studio running. Uh, so we were closed, completely closed, with no one entering the building until the beginning of June. Um, so we did a lot of free online social engagement through social media. We, we had various artists that teach for us doing Instagram Lives. We did tours of our home collection. We hosted Zoom happy hours with our students um, and just tried to keep our community engaged. Um, and in the meantime, of course, I, um, I'm the, the supervisor for our facility as far as the protocols. Um, and so I was researching. I feel really fortunate um, being in Seattle and being part of Seattle Center. Um, this is not the only support group I'm involved in. Um, Seattle Center has a lot of um, arts organizations, not necessarily hands-on visual arts, 
but performing arts and music venues. So I meet with a group of folks from there, um, as well as various other little bits and pieces. Um, and it's, it was a lot of meetings and a lot of just, um, just deciphering information from Washington State. Um, so in June, uh, Washington State entered phase 1.5 and then phase two. And the first thing that we did is, is get our residents back in the building um, because this is their livelihood. Um, you know, this is their job. And we had basically said, I'm really sorry, but you can't go to work right now. Um, we started doing clay sales um, and we initially had delivery just to avoid having a lot of people in the facility. And then we um, transitioned into having folks come in in August, we did contactless pick up and drop off of work. Um, and we did a very small session of online classes. Um, and it was, you know, the enrollment was pretty low. I think the highest enrollment we had was 17 people in a one hour, um, in a two hour Zoom class, because at that point, folks really weren't in Seattle, the cost of living is really high. Um, and a lot of people don't have a space where they can work with clay. Um, so then in August, um, we started doing contactless pick up and drop off so that they could come into our kiln yard, which is an indoor outdoor facility, and then began um, really ramping up planning our second round of classes and reopening the studio. Um, and so now we, we successfully opened for a monthly studio access. Um, we're still offering online classes. Um, we, we can't in-person classes aren't feasible in Washington State for us right now because financially it would be for students and an instructor and it's, it's just not financially viable. Um, so what we are doing some hybrid workshops um, that are um, centered on firing. So we just did a, a soda firing workshop this weekend and they met on Zoom and the instructor walked them through all of our shop glazes and slips, and then they could sign up for an individual slot to come in and help load the kiln or help um, spray soda or help unload and clean. Um, we're doing class kits for specialized materials, and we're still doing clay sales, and we bundle the, the cost of bisque firing, glaze firing, and glazes into the cost of the clay. So this is what our wheel throwing studio looked like before COVID. We had 24 wheels, um, you can see, they're only maybe 12 inches apart. Um, so this is kind of, and I'm happy to share this um, PowerPoint. There was a lot of moving parts to get this going because we have an online waiver. We have a on, daily online health check they have to do. We created an online scheduling system and investigated different scheduling apps. Um, we also had to think about how we we're gonna staff the hours were open because previously we had a system of volunteer monitors and we didn't feel comfortable asking them um, to make sure people were wearing their, wearing their masks and social distancing. Um, but we did all that. Um, now I just continue to plan online classes and hybrid workshops. I'm also starting to plan for phase three, although honestly, I don't think that that's gonna affect us a whole lot. I don't know that it's gonna allow us enough people to make classes financially viable. And I also don't expect that to happen until spring. Um, so these were some of the considerations. Um, we also, obviously all of us, anti-racism became a really big consideration. We have always offered um, scholarships that were need and equity based, but we've really tried to focus all of our promotion to make sure that every single thing that we send out, whether it's our newsletter or social media, that we're really reminding folks that they can apply for these scholarships. Um, we worked really hard to eliminate all high touch areas. Um, and I'm still in the process of putting a lot more signs up. One of the things I ask people when they come in um, is if they can just um, let me know if there's anything that they see that they have a question about or they don't feel comfortable with so that we can continue to adapt because we really didn't know until we got into this. Um, so we now have 15 individual spaces that are self-contained. They promote easy social distancing and they eliminate all those high touch areas. Uh, we built brand new tables for this. Each area has a wheel. Um, these big blue tubs that you see are our new sinks. Um, they're half full of water with bleach in them. Um, so we eliminated 
um, rather than invest in a lot of heavy duty cleaning equipment and then the staff to do that cleaning, we tried to make our, our community members, our students responsible um, for cleaning up their areas. So we have multiple disinfectant stations and we ask everyone to completely disinfect when they come in and then do their work. Every time they go to get, and we eliminated most of our shared tools. There's just a few things like banding wheels, the extruder, the slab roller, um, the shop glazes are all in five gallon buckets so they can be wheeled into the station to be used. And we ask that everyone disinfects every single thing that they touch before they put it back. And then they also need to clean and disinfect their station before they leave. Um, and so um, this is just a summary of what we offer. Um, we're charging, I mean, it's, it's definitely not bringing in the same income as our classes, but it's been pretty successful. We're getting ready um, for enrollment. It's by the month. So October 1st is, is month two and we were seeing enrollment increase. Um, we charge $200 a month and they can pre-schedule 10 hours a week and then as many day of hours as are available. Um, and this is what is on our website as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I was over six minutes. Um, so this is my email address. It's chanda at potterynorthwest.org. I am more than happy to share this PowerPoint or any information that I can because um, I think it's really important that we all work together to figure out a solution. So, and that's it. Chanda, thank you so much. Will you put your email address in the chat in case folks wanna just copy and paste? Um, yeah. And then we'll make sure your, your PowerPoint gets shared out for folks who wanna, who wanna- Yeah, I can it. upload that into that folder. I yeah, mean, if you could, that would be awesome. And then for, for anyone who uh, is joining us for the first time, we do have a Google Share Drive that we've been dropping all of our resources in. So stuff from this, um, from this panel uh, will be available in there as well. So thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Kelly Sullivan. Uh, Kelly's the director of the Community Arts and Crafts Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. So Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Um, our, it sounds a lot like our um, studios are very similar to what Chanda just talked about. Um, we actually have a pottery studio, a dance studio, and a clay studio. Uh, sorry, a general studio where we do drawing and painting. And we also shut down uh, on March 17th. We actually had a class scheduled that morning, so I had to race into work and call everybody and tell them that uh, they could not come to class. We actually postponed that class until June and they were able to finish, which was good. Um, damp boxes were really good in the clay studio for from March until June. It kept everything nice and wet. Um, the thing that we've had to do is definitely reduce the amount of people we have in our studios um, to probably half or less than half because our studio space is really small and unfortunately we don't have windows. We're in the middle of a, of a block building so we've definitely kept our adults to no more than six people in a room uh, plus the instructor and our kids, we can go up to 10, especially if they come in sibling pairs, because we do put them in sibling, we call them pods too. They're family pods and they kind of hang out with each other. Um, we have reduced the amount of extra people that we've had in our space, so no guests are allowed to come in and see what everybody's doing, um, which is unfortunate, but when we get back to normal, that'll be okay. Um, any assistants that we had that aren't staff are no longer allowed to assist in classes. Um, and everybody from our littlest tiny creatures, the three-year-olds that come in to our adults do have to wear um, masks the entire time that they're in the building. And um, we actually didn't have a mandatory mask uh, requirement until July, but I have been requiring it in our art studio since May 24th when we opened. Um, as far as our classes are going, we haven't seen a lot of non-clay classes in the past couple of months. And I think that's because people do feel like they can do drawing and painting at home potentially, and even do those things in Zoom classes a lot more easy, 
easily than especially wheel throwing. So um, our wheel throwing classes have been doing really well and our hand building classes are doing really well. We also, in conjunction with our in-person classes, have been offering um, online hand building classes. We don't, we tried the Zoom thing. It was uh, very confusing for a lot of our students. So what we do is we record the instructional demo and they pick up the materials, go home and do the project, drop it back off so we can fire it. Um, in the beginning, before, uh, before we were allowed to reopen, we did have a curbside drop off and pick up for those things. But now um, we have a table that's set up in an area that people can come in as long as they have a mask on and drop off anything that they've done. Um, we have not sent glazes home. We give them options of the 42 glazes that we have in our studio. They pick that option and the staff member will actually glaze it for them. Um, we do send under glazes home, but not we, we hadn't figured out the glaze thing. So we just glaze it for them. Um, we're, we're now doing in-person classes and and also including the online classes and both are being well received by our community. Um, in the very beginning, we were doing a lot of free uh, take home projects for families and children. And we were getting all kinds of, you know, thank you for keeping us from going crazy. And um, we would have up to 60 people coming in to pick up projects for that. We have stopped the free ones for now because we are getting busier in our studios. So that's good. And um, we do offer something that's called open studio where people can come in and um, use our wheels and use the hand building space and they can glaze. And the one thing that we did completely have to change is how people were glazing because our glaze area was always congested before the pandemic. So we have scheduled um, individual slots. And if you're not on the schedule, you cannot glaze and you have to email me ahead of time so that um, you know, people know who's gonna be glazing. And only that person is in there for a three hour block and then, and then they're finished. Um, <clears throat> the kiln room was another area in our studios that would be very congested, so we have limited the amount of people who can be in the kiln room at any given time. Um, and we, we do loan out tools and supplies for our online classes and we still do have our shared tools, but they are disinfected after every class. And we do also ask our students to um, disinfect them if they've used something before putting it away. Um, and then we do, I'm really excited because on October 5th, we will have our very first adult drawing class, which we haven't had since March. Um, and people are, I think people are starting to try to come out a little bit more. So we'll see how that goes. And then I've tried to offer hybrid classes. I think people get a little confused. We, um, I really want to off our, our very small printing press that we have and people just can't get the concept of making the plates at home and then coming to print them on our press. I'm hoping that it catches on one day and we'll be able to do that. Um, and the, the biggest thing is we're just you know, basically limiting the amount of people we have in the class, making sure that we are cleaning all of the time as well and everybody has to wear a mask. We are also offering complete refunds if somebody is sick and can't come. So that was one of the other things that we have been doing since the beginning. And I like Mary Jo and uh, Shanda, or is it Chanda? Um, and the person who is responsible for making all of these guidelines. And I do have an administration that helps me out, but for the most part, they are not artists and don't understand how art things work. So we had to figure it all out. And I appreciate you, for, you all for having me on this panel. I've learned a lot and hopefully I was able to share some information as well. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you so much. No problem. And My our, pleasure. <laughs> our last speaker today um, is Joelle Montez, studio technician and faculty at the Evergreen State College in Washington. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Joelle. Thanks, Nicole. 
Hi everybody, my name is Joelle, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm in Olympia, Washington. Um, I work at a state college and we're on the quarter system, so we teach 10 week long programs. Um, when we shut down in March, everything went fully remote and students were already primarily enrolled for classes that were on the catalog. So we had to decide whether we were gonna pivot within two weeks to teach entirely remote or if we were just gonna cancel classes. So to start off, um, I'll tell you all what I did in the spring. I was scheduled to teach a figure sculpture class that was supposed to be um, life-size bust making. And instead what I decided to do was order a bunch of oil-based clay and send home kits to students to make um, like 12 inch tall full figure sculpture. So to just give you a little visual reference, this is kind of the scale we were working at. Um, definitely not ceramics, but it seemed like the best thing I could do at the moment. Um, some of the things that worked really well was I think giving people something to do that they could do at home pretty easily. So the kits were pretty cheap. Um, we were able to do curbside pickup and then we shipped what we, um, what we couldn't have students come pick up. And <clears throat> every week I uploaded a video demo of a different stage of sculpting. We focused uh, largely on anatomy and proportion. So I did a demo video that was specifically clay based and then I also supplemented it quite a bit with figure drawing. And I found some really great free online art model um, kind of tutorial sites, which I'm happy to share if people are interested. And students every week had to do um, exercises and upload them to Google Drive, which is how I graded their progress. And that was something that was really tricky, actually. I think that one of the biggest things that was a challenge for me was um, not having the right software and the right hardware to make decent videos and to also edit them. So it was a very big learning curve um, in those regards. Um, it was also tricky to actually keep students engaged. I think that was kind of a big struggle for everyone just coming into shutdown. Um, that's something that I'm definitely trying to work on this quarter is um, set up class in a way that works better with the students needs um, and really get them to give me feedback in what works for them. Um, so one of the things that I found also didn't work was trying to do too much asynchronous learning. Students really struggled with, I think, self-motivating and actually just sitting in front of the computer watching videos and then just uploading it and having pretty little contact. So we ended up doing a lot of sculpting just over live video, which was pretty fun. So we watched together a a video of a filmed art model and we'd sculpt together and kind of share the process. And that was, that was kind of a nice way to stay engaged. Um, so my other job is managing the ceramic studio. So I've kind of been seeing both sides of teaching remotely and trying to write policies for coming back to in-person instruction and we were going to run a couple classes this summer so i wrote a very detailed policy on all of kind of the same things everyone's went uh, went through already but we decided we weren't ready for it yet there were just too many moving parts so we're still um, fully remote right now i have set the studio up in stations similar to what other people showed, so that there is social distancing, everyone will get their own toolkit when we are ready to have people back in the studio. But for now, we're still fully remote. 
and I'm teaching a hand building class that starts tomorrow actually. So students will come and pick up their kits, they'll set up a studio at home, um, and we'll meet over Zoom once a week and do a demo. Um, and you know the constraint of all the projects is COVID, so everyone will be learning how to make stuff that's going to survive traveling to campus. Um, they're going to get three different colors of underglaze and that's going to be it. We're going to focus a lot on surface um, and kind of like shape and function as well as durability. So it'll be an interesting way to kind of give students a creative outlet and also an exercise and like, okay, what can we actually do working in our homes? Because I think um, a lot of people do encounter that anyway after they are no longer students. So that's kind of how I'm approaching it. And I like everyone's idea about the, the glazing. That's kind of a big thing that I've been trying to wrap my head around. So I think we're also going to have staff glaze student work and then fire it and then they'll pick it up again. Um, another thing that's been super helpful is that I do have student employees, so they're also helping um, with managing online teaching with the chat and just being a go-to person for students who might not be quite as comfortable online or coming to instructors. Um, our kind of first trial run with in-person stuff will be just a couple advanced students who will have access to the studio. So I'm pretty excited to see how that goes. I think one thing that's a little challenging for us, and this might be because uh, we're a state school, but uh, COVID supervisors have to be present whenever anybody is in the space. And in the ceramics studio, that's me. And I work 20 hours a week, so it's a very limited um, amount of time. So we're still trying to figure out how to bring people back into the studio safely. And still very much a work in progress, but I have hopes that in the winter we'll be able to move a little closer toward a hybrid, if not um, a full in-person offering. But thanks everybody, I think that's it. Joel, thank you so much. Um, if everybody could humor me for a moment and take your video or put your video on, take yourself off mute, and I want everyone to give all these folks a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. That was that was so informative, y'all. Um, we we have tons of time for questions. So uh, if you have a question that you want to drop in the chat. Nicole and I are going to kind of cruise director those uh, things as they come up. Um, otherwise, if you'd rather verbalize your question, please use the raise hand function and we'll call on y'all. Um, but to kick this off, I do want to back up because there, there was a question for way back for our first presenter, Lisa, in the chat. Uh, Tony asked something about glazes. I'm just going to read it out loud and then Lisa, if you could, if you could tell us the answer for anybody who might have missed it in the chat. So Tony asked, uh, with your Glaze Go kits, which is brilliant, by the way, did your institution take issue with creating kits with materials not in their originally labeled containers? If so, did you find ways to create manageable sizes of materials to lend out? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so if Please, nobody here alert my administration to that question because that would be horrible. Um, because I didn't even think of that until Tony asked, damn you. Um, but we did get um, hundreds of plastic, lidded plastic to go containers from a restaurant supply store. We got a larger four ounce size for glazes and a smaller one ounce size for under glazes. And they all get boxed in like a little to go box. Um, we just labeled them with the name of the product. And he really wanted to have that, um, the information that's on the MSDS sheet. 
I would just be able to send them the link to that information because it's all available online. We only use commercial products like Amico and um, Laguna. So it's all online. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we're doing. It, there's relatively small containers. Um, and we just wanted the student, you know, we wanted not to have waste. And so we went with a relatively small four ounce size. Again, we're on 10 week quarters. And then if a student ran out of a particular color, they could just ask for more and we would give them more. At the end of spring quarter, we probably got back, I don't know, a third of it that was completely unused. And so we could recycle some of that and wash out and reuse some of the containers again. I think that helped. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question and, uh, from Rebecca. For any organizations with work studies, can you explain a bit more how that has changed and what new procedures you are having to do from pre-COVID? Joel, I know you mentioned a little bit about how work studies are operating. Um, so I don't know if you want to jump back on that and if any of the rest of the panelists want to share. Sure. I'm our work study program might be slightly different in that, um, let me think, I'm trying to think what the work studies are like out there, but basically they're just subsidized student aids and we have been still employing them as best as possible. In the springtime, I had four work study students and I had one that was particularly helping specifically with my class to, like I said, manage the chat. They were fully responsible also for putting together toolkits, helping me just do regular maintenance in the studio. Um, but it was still all remote stuff. Um, nobody had access to the studio, not even the work study folks. We did try to host like an open studio online that was just a place for people to gather and do projects together, which unfortunately didn't really work out. Um, I don't think anyone was looking for more computer time, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's mainly what, what I did is have them just assist me online. Any, other, uh, any of the other panelists want to share to that? I can talk about what we're doing now um, because I actually have 10 work studies at this point that work with me in the studio. Um, and because of the way we redesigned the studio, everyone who enters our building has to follow the same procedures of doing an online health check, signing in and signing out so we have contact tracing if necessary. Um, and wearing masks and social distancing. But the way that our 15 workstations are set up, the areas that the work study folks are in are separate from their, they're in our clay and glaze mixing room or they're working in the kiln room. And our, our monthly access folks who are primarily students aren't in those areas at all. That's not part of where they should be. Um, so it doesn't affect our capacity uh, because our work studies are considered staff. They do a work exchange and they work eight hours a week in return for their own monthly studio access. And then they have to sign in and sign out for the studio access on the SCETA calendar, just like everyone else. Um, and I also, it used to be that I would schedule them to work um, pre-pandemic, uh, a lot of times in teams, um, especially to, to pair someone who is more experienced with a new work study so that they could train, you know, have a self-training component. Um, and now I find I'm here on evenings and weekends a lot as I'm training the new folks, um, not in the COVID procedures, but in the studio procedures. So, and I, they're scheduled one at a time. It's very rare that they overlap. Cool to shift gears a little bit since we have so many ceramicists in here. Um, that popular question that keeps coming up, what are you doing with that recycled clay? I'm curious from everybody's point of view, what, it, what have you been doing? Yeah. Um, we specifically put it in our rules and we've been really adamant. We removed all of our reclaim buckets and our re the reclaim that we have already, we're processing because it's been sitting for three months. But until I see something definitive that says we are done worrying about surfaces, um, we are asking everyone to process their own reclaim 
by saving it in a bisque fired bowl and then wedging it back up again and or if they really don't want to do that then they have to be aware that they're throwing it away because um, we're just not doing that. Anyone else reclaimed clay? Any other strategies? I would love if anyone that's participating here today wants to throw what their studio is doing in the comments because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big question for all of us. We're um, collecting some slop clay for recycling in big, um, I think they're 30 or 40 gallon garbage bag, uh, garbage cans, but we're letting it sit for, I think, two weeks before our technician goes in and scoops the slop out to put it in our pug mill. So basically I'm having all students um, just wedge up and recycle their own and um, you know, if they're working at home, uh, and that might be difficult, they don't have a wedging table at home, they can throw it out and maybe aren't recycling. Um, but it's just dirt, so they can put it in the backyard and it's not toxic or anything to just put out under a bush somewhere outside. Um, so we're kind of doing it, but waiting a long time and definitely not doing as much as we normally would. Okay, um, yeah, if anyone else is doing something, I'd love to see that in the comments. The next question, and I'm excited to, to hear if anyone knows anything about this. Has anyone tried glass blowing classes yet? Oh, sorry, I just put something up on the chat about that. I was on another similar um, panel with uh, the glass professor from RIT, and I put his name on there, and um, he's doing it. That's awesome. I also um, just happened to see on TikTok, there is a studio and they're using foot pedal blowers instead of breath. So that was something. If anyone else knows anything about glass blowing, maybe throw it in the comments. Uh, let's see, we have a question specifically for Mary Jo at Snow Farm. How well are people sticking to their pods? Uh, they're actually doing really well. I think that um, we communicate it um, in our information on our website, when they, uh, when we're closer to the class, we remind them um, in our emails. And then when they get here, especially um, as they, uh, before the meal, um, we put signs on the table where they're supposed to eat together. And some people, um, we have a lot of wide open spaces here. So some people will just take their meal off and um, go sit by themselves. We've also added outside each studio. We're really trying to use the outdoors. We've put a picnic table and a pop-up tent outside each studio. So if someone needs to take a little break from, you know, uh, with their mask or they just want outdoor time, it gives them some more spaces outdoors that they can just sort of relax. So I would say, you know, people are doing a really amazing um, job at um, following our guidelines and staying in their pods. Okay, looks like um, a little more info going in to the chat about glass blowing, which is awesome. I had a question for Louise. Um, you had mentioned that you've got doors and windows open at all times and invited people to bring layers, and that really works for me and how I'm processing the information about how COVID is spread, but I'm wondering what your plan is for, for, for winter, for now, maybe. So Andrews Ranch canceled the residency program. We run workshops until end of September. And then in the fall and spring, we have uh, the residency. It's canceled because we cannot host anyone on campus. The dorms are closed. Um, we don't know when we're opening again. So, but we are actually running, it's called facilitated studio practice and started today. So it's almost like a residency rental but it's again, focused on locals. So I have three people enrolled. They pay a premium to have half of the whole studio for themselves. I could only have max of four, I have three. Um, and we talked about this today. So that even though it's a big space they're in, they can still, um, they have to wear masks at all the times. We have an air purifier whenever like the, the day is beautiful right now. So 
I do have two doors open that have some cross air glowing, like some flow going through the studios. We will see. Like, yeah, it's a reduced number of people now. So it's very different. It's, yeah. I want to toss that question out to any of the other panelists. Winter, winter. What are you What are you doing when you get when you have to shut the windows and doors? Mary Jo. Well, we actually did order outdoor propane heaters um, that restaurants use, and so we have those to try to extend the time people can eat outdoors, or we'll probably move them around. But we are going. We are telling our instructors that they can have the heat on and have airflow outside to have that exchange. So we know that there's additional expense incurred with that. Um, and we also have some covered but open air spaces that we have moved sort of furniture into so they can lounge, but um, it's true. I mean, I think what we've said is, you know, this is a time that, um, you know, there's gonna be like more time to Think about your creative process and um, and really focus on that and 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 also um, you know that outdoor space um, we will try to use it as much as possible until the end of October and then we'll um, be closed for the winter. Uh, I have a, a document, I believe, a slideshow from the. There is a specialist, a nurse, who is working with the Seattle Center organizations, and mm -hmm. I just was at that meeting last week. Um, so we're working on, right now, we're also operating with our front and back doors open and a heavy-duty ventilation fan. And actually, the shelving units, as opposed to plexiglass in between the individual spaces, help promote that all of the air flows in one direction and out of our building. Um, we know that come November, that's going to be too cold. Um, so we're working on retrofitting our air scrubbers with HEPA filters. But I also, in this seminar I went to last week, um, they were actually talking about, and this is coming from someone who's interpreting regulations, of, um, and this was a solution for the smoke um, that was here in the Pacific Northwest, but that you can actually buy a HEPA filter for an air conditioning system and you can just masking tape it or duct tape it or whatever kind of tape you want to use to a box fan. And you have to be careful about where you position it, but it's basically going to scrub some of the COVID, um, the aerosols out of the air. So it's a really low tech, low cost solution to try to deal with that. And I believe they actually said that it was, a, I wrote it down, but it's upstairs in my office that a MERV 13 filter is better than the HEPA filters because the HEPA filters really slow down the airflow, so they're not as effective. Yeah, MERV 13. Uh, so that's a thought. I'll see if I can find that PowerPoint and also add it um, to our shared folder. Um, Lisa had a question. Has anyone else had positive COVID cases at their institution regardless of following their guidelines? So I'll, I'll say that um, we had two staff members who were sick, but not with COVID symptoms, but they went to their physician and automatically the physicians have the COVID test taken. So they stayed home until they got the test results. They were negative, so we were relieved. Um, but we've also, our flexible uh, cancellation policy has been really helpful. Um, we have had students call and say, um, I'm just, I feel like I have this symptom. And so we've canceled them, whether it's a day or the morning of, and some have actually gotten tested and then gotten negative results and were able to come. So we're, you know, fielding all that communications. But overall, we have not um, had to um, deal, deal with a positive case. So we have a couple more minutes. So if anyone does have a question, please shout it out. And again, I do wanna just encourage folks um, who are not on the panel, but are doing some in-person instruction to feel free to drop any, um, any highlights in the comments for us. 
and I will uh, we will try to we'll figure out a way to get that into the video as well. Well, if no one else has a question, I have a question to maybe close us out. Uh, this is this is for Chanda. Um, while you were talking, you said you were you you were working to eliminate high touch areas in your studio as opposed to having folks clean it. I thought that was a really uh, valuable and interesting way to like flip that problem. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more specifically about that. Yeah, um, when I first started thinking about planning, we have, our space is, is large, it's 7,000 square feet. It originally had a wheel throwing teaching area in the front and then a hand building in the back. And as we went along in the planning and it, as I was like, I kept thinking about like, how do we keep up with this? Because the amount of, we have four staff and all of us are already like at capacity as far as what we can do. And I was like, I don't know how we're gonna keep up with this cleaning. And so then my focus changed from, and, and I, I got to a point where I just, I let go of all those preconceived notions. And I thought they can bring their own brushes and they can bring a cleanup sponge and they can bring bats and they can, bring all these small things that otherwise I just, it's, it's habit. I will also say that while we were going through all this planning, um, I read two different books about habits and how habits are formed and how we change them. And so one of the big focuses is, and I've, I've noticed this, like I've made adjustments even in the last couple of weeks, because I can tell that people are still going to the old communal sinks, despite the fact that we roped it off and put a sign up. Um, so I, I just like I moved tools away from the sink. I adjusted the ropes to kind of get that sign like right in front of them. So they have to like really forcibly move it out of the way. Um, and we and everybody has been really great about this. We've we've tried. It's in our waiver and it's in the email that we send out to them. Like be aware you're going to need to bring these supplies in. Um, but we really decided we're a community studio and we were asking our our, our students, our community members, to take some of the responsibility for the cleaning, cleaning and the disinfecting. And I will say it's it's working really well so far. Knock on my plastic table here. So, if, if yeah. I could add, we've done similar things. Is that um, you know we do have sort of the supply a supply central area in each studio, so people can feel free to wipe down the equipment as they're using it and. They lay out their tools on the table and we'll spray it down and leave it, let it set as they leave so our studio management can come in and um, put it down. We have UV sanitizers um, in some of the studios. We have an autoclave sanitizer in one of our studios um, that um, disinfects with high, um, high uh, temperature steam. Um, and we, you know, so we, there is, own, like, we talk about that this is a partnership, that we have to do this together, that, um, you know, it's, and so we have also encouraged our students to bring as much as of their own tools as they feel comfortable doing, um, yet we'll have some on hand if they do need it. Um, so, and, and that has definitely worked. Probably the biggest shift that we've changed is with our um, we do have dorms that are being used and we've asked, it was not, a, it was both COVID and also financial. Um, every, we've asked everybody to actually bring their pillow, like camp, bring their pillows and sheets and blankets and towels. That's also a savings for us um, to not have to provide that, but we felt people would actually be more comfortable doing that. So we definitely, as you know, we just, and we've approached really everything to just say, you know what, it's a new day, like try to stop thinking in the way that we're used to thinking. Um, and that was sort of providing and doing everything for our students. So changing that habit and thinking differently has been, um, you know, sometimes a challenge. Thank you, Mary Jo. I, and I'm looking at the clock right now, I think that was just a beautiful note to end on, uh, thinking differently about how to approach these problems. Um, again, I want to thank everyone who presented today. Let's give another round of applause to these folks. Uh, I found this so incredibly helpful, and I know uh, 
the, I think we were up to almost 50 people at one point. I imagine the 50 people who attended also found this very helpful and refreshing. So thank you for being so generous in uh, showing us glimpses of what this looks like, what this future looks like for all of us. Um, so I dropped my email in the chat. If anybody wants to be added to the Google Drive, um, any like resources and things, also maybe a copy of this entire group chat, we'll put it in the Google Drive. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll do this again. Maybe we'll find some new panelists and uh, offer this once again. Um, Nicole, do you have some closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I definitely learned a lot. I do just want to thank, I want to thank all of the panelists, Amanda, for co-hosting and all of you who came out today. Um, I'd love to see us maybe do this again if it would be useful to folks. Um, and again. Awesome. Thank you all so much, everybody.